Hello, Made to Thrive Nation. We've got a very special guest on the show, Dr. Kavita Desai. She's a pharmacist, woman health specialist, founder of, I'm going to say this wrong, but she's going to correct me, Revival, I think. Nope, that's correct. Okay, I got it. I got it right. Uh, and this is a special show because we're going to be mainly talking about women's health, talk about toxicity, endocrine disruptors, the sort of pervasive and exponential increase of Alzheimer's, cognitive decline, uh, things like dementia and neurodegenerative conditions that are really uh, escalating at a very, very scary rate. So welcome to the show, Dr. Kavita. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Brilliant. Well, uh, you've got an incredible calling and a great story, but tell us about the state, the current state of cognitive you know, decline, what's happening with Alzheimer's, why it's become such a big issue. Yeah, so we're seeing such a large increase in it. We don't necessarily know the cause of Alzheimer's per se, but we do know that our lifestyle, our diet, um, our environment, all of it is contributing to an unhealthy brain. And although you know, those of us that are affected by it. My mom had early onset Alzheimer's, which is what, you know, drew me to learning more about it and specializing in it. Um, we, you know, that population tends to be more concerned about their own brain health long term, but we're seeing it happening to people that have genetic risk or not happening necessarily, whether you turn your genes on or not is completely up to your choices that you make in life. And there are people that think they're not at risk that can end up getting Alzheimer's. My mom was a good example of that. She does not have a family history of early onset Alzheimer's, and yet she was affected by it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's something that we all need to be concerned about moving forward. All right. Well, give us some stats, what's happening in first world countries. You know, it's crazy out there to see what's happening to autoimmune. We've done quite a few podcasts. Dr. Stephen Gundry talking about 25% of the American population. It's about 80 million people that have an autoimmune mm -hmm. disease. I mean, I'm pretty sure that autoimmune, having been in practice for 23 years, is one of the reasons possibly, you know, that people are getting, you know, degenerative conditions. But what are the current states of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's and why should people actually care about neurodegenerative conditions? Yeah, so there's about 50 million or so people worldwide that currently have Alzheimer's disease. And that's just what we know. I mean, we don't often it's it goes undiagnosed in women especially a lot of our symptoms mimic other disease states we don't always know that it's cognitive decline until it's much later um, and we're seeing that exponentially rising um, that they're predicting in the next 20 to 30 years that that was, is going to multiply exponentially so you know it's something that's going to become an epidemic i believe that we should be very very concerned about so people listening out there, male and female, but even, you know, mainly females, let's take uh, your day, your week, your month, your year in terms of looking after their brains. You know, I think, mm -hmm. you know, having done a lot of podcasts on heart health, if you look after your heart, you look after your brain. If you look after your right. brain, you look after your health. But take us through sort of what's really, really important with regards to your daily, weekly, monthly routine in terms of brain health. So I like to you use the analogy, right? That um, our brain health is a little bit like having a, a tire with numerous slow leaks, that that's our risk factors. And if you only address one or two of those slow leaks, you can still continue down the road. You just won't get as far as if you address as many of those leaks as possible. And our risk factors for cognitive decline are very similar, that there's, there's a wide range of things that we think we should be addressing to reduce our risk as much as possible. Mm. So in women, especially perimenopausal women, as their hormones start to change, they start to have a lot of side effects that are also the same as the risk factors that we talk about for cognitive decline. So, you know, men and women alike, I think these are all risk factors, whether you happen to experience them more than somebody else, you know, that can sometimes be determined by gender and hormone changes. Um, but things like sleep, for instance, sleep is a huge a poor sleep is a huge risk factor for cognitive decline. If you're not sleeping at least seven hours of good restful sleep, that's a problem. And that's a problem for numerous diseases, but definitely for cognitive decline. Um, also, well, let's stop you there when you talk about sleep. Okay. Then you tell, let's talk about Dr. Kavita, who's, you know, a specialist, obviously done a lot of work in, you know, this area. How do you optimize your sleep? What are the sort of non-negotiables for yourself uh, and women and men in terms of their sleep quality and quantity? Yeah, so some of the things are devices, right? That's a huge one. We all take our devices to our bedroom and I do not. I plug them, which is harder now in the days where we don't have landlines. So I think people are concerned that 
they won't have a phone nearby. Um, I choose to keep a landline for that reason so that if there's an emergency, we still have a phone, um, but I do not bring my devices upstairs. Not only is the blue light disruptive, um, just the, it's just not good for our brain health to have those waves around our, us all the time. Or worst case scenario, turn it on to airplane mode if you choose to take your phone up, and up to your bedroom. Um, also cutting off caffeine later in the day, reducing alcohol intake, obviously later in the day, but in general. Um, also, I like to take um, a magnesium glycinate supplement, um, L-theanine and melatonin at night, which kind of helps with more restful sleep. And then it's also just how you start your day and live your day can affect your sleep. So, you know, con regular exercise, um, how you eat, a lot of that is also changing your diet can help improve sleep as well. So sleep's like fundamental, one of the foundational sort of aspects of brain health, although people aren't respecting their sleep. And, you you know, we use the aura ring or the whoop or some measurable device. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is sort of, you know, really important for people living in a city? I know you're living in Barbados now. It's sort of mm -hmm. island lifestyle, chilled, relaxed, <laughs> probably you've got great sleep. But for people listening in Western cities, what is your recommendation on getting data on HRV and, you know, REM sleep, deep sleep and those type of things? I think if it motivates you, 100% do it, because I think it's a little bit like wearing a steps tracker. I find that very motivating when I know if I've had a day where I've just been sitting a great portion of the day, then it motivates me to spend some time outdoors or you know, even just walking around the house or in front of the TV. Mm. Um, I think sleep tracking is the same. It gives you a very good insight as to whether you're actually sleeping well and restfully enough to heal your brain. Okay, so brilliant. And what does the research say? Or do you know sort of the effects of, you know, getting good REM sleep or deep sleep with regards to Alzheimer's or cognitive decline? Is, is that those two sort of sleep cycles very important to look at? Or what is your view in terms of measuring those? Yeah, I think we want to see how much deep sleep we're getting. The higher percentage of deep sleep and restorative sleep that we get is what will protect the gray matter long term. Okay. And so what are strategies in terms of sleep, other than what you mentioned specifically for deep, are there any things that you could sort of recommend to the listeners? On top of what I did, I think it's a lifestyle change, right? It's if unfortunately for women, when their hormones are changing for them, it might even be replacing some of those hormones. So if you, sup, you know, take bioidentical progesterone and replace your estrogen, that can bring back some of the, the proper sleep, which is out of our control. Mm. So aside from making the lifestyle changes, it may mean for a therapy choice as well. Okay, good. Okay, so we've spoken about sleep. Uh, let's talk about sort of the next foundational pillar with regards to Alzheimer's and sort of cognitive decline in general. So I think that's where gut health comes in, which again is linked to numerous disease states. I think that's the thing. Our body is, you know, it's a domino effect. But for brain health in particular, there's such a strong gut brain connection. We have, you know, millions of nerve endings in the gut that signal to our brain. And if we're not prioritizing maintaining that gut health, instantaneously your brain can't function either. And that can lead to a lot of not only autoimmune disease and brain fog and um, you know, and then cognitive, cognitive decline potentially as well. So I think that's changing diet, you know, you need to be consuming things that can promote your gut microbiome. Okay, so what is Dr. Kavita, you know, how does she look after her microbiome? And I think it's quite cool is like you've mentioning these things that are important. And then let's look at your own personal story. Obviously, you've got a history we can get into what happened to your mom who mm -hmm. got early onset Alzheimer's. But, you know, I think now that you it's a real story and a real tragedy in your life. Uh, how do you look after yourself with regards to foundational pillars like gut health? So yeah, I changed my diet fairly significantly um, after my mom was diagnosed because I became quite concerned for my own health. So I eliminated a lot of inflammatory foods. So that's a lot of Western dairy is quite inflammatory. I think, you know, we're not eating the way we did, our ancestors did. So dairy can be quite inflammatory. And that was an interesting story for me because I didn't have an intolerance to dairy that I knew of, but when I stopped eating dairy, all of a sudden my mind was sharper. I was sleeping significantly better. And oddly, um, although I say to limit alcohol, red wine suddenly tasted good to me. I could not drink red wine when I was still consuming a lot of dairy. I think just the inflammation must have changed my taste and every, it always tasted like cork, but suddenly red wine tasted the way I think it's, it should. So it was just interesting. It was a bit of a science experiment in 
how we can be inflamed and not even realize that we are. And I saw a significant improvement in my own, just my own daily well-being. Like I noticed it when I stopped consuming as much dairy. Um, and of course, you know, I cheat every once in a while, but that was one of the big ones. And then obviously gluten. So I don't consume a lot of processed carbs, um, fairly plant-based diet um, with some meat, but we try to buy, you know, organic grass-fed antibiotic and hormone-free meats. Um, and then drinking lots of water, again, reducing alcohol and process, just processed foods and sugars, right? So reducing how much sugar we, we consume in our household is also important for co long-term cognitive health. Okay, so we, we need, let's talk about dairy because I think that's important for people listening. Is it the, the dairy, raw dairy, or is it A1, you know, milk or A2 milk? Or, or what is, uh, you know, how important is those factors? Because I think dairy is not exactly like it used to. So, you yeah. know, so should it's people... Oh, sorry, that, go ahead. No problem. Should people eliminate the dairy and see and then test with like testing markers like HSCRP and interleukin-6 and 10 and look at the inflammatory markers or should they just wait and see and then try gluten as well? Because if people, you know, cut gluten and dairy, it's quite, it's quite a tough process for a lot of people. Yeah, and generally I don't recommend doing it all, right? You do what you can sustain because I think that's that's the realistic way of living, right? Is that you make the the small changes in your diet and lifestyle that that is feasible for you to maintain and still be happy because at the end of the day we still mm. have to enjoy our life. Um I believe it's the casein in the dairy that can be inflammatory. In my case, I, I actually did feel better, so that's the reason I limit it. Again, I don't I haven't completely eliminated it all the time, but 90% of the time I try not to, you know, I'll use alternate, you know, milk substitutes in my coffee or, or not at all. Mm. Um, I choose not to eat a lot of cheese and whatnot. Um, and same with gluten. Again, you know, you may or may not have an intolerance. I know there's a lot of research being done about how inflammatory it is though, even though we may not realize it. So sometimes just trying an elimination for three weeks and seeing how much better you may feel, um, is is probably the best way to determine what will work for you long term. I don't think getting markers done is necessarily feasible by all um by everyone. So okay. even just trying an elimination can work. Okay, but if people can because I mean obviously there's continuum in terms of free elimination diets free it saves you money and you can just see the way you feel. Maybe yes. you can look at your own data at night, but if people do have the resources to check what should they check? Um I don't know a whole lot about the inflammatory marker mm. testing to to suggest exactly what we should be looking for but um you know your c-reactive protein can go up um you know for me it's been predominantly just how i feel okay. um, and just based on the data data for cognitive health is they're recommending that we eliminate a lot of these inflammatory foods Okay, so if if you had to sort of give us a priority list, I know people are going to ask me this and they're going to send stuff. In terms of cognitive health, brain health, uh, we you know we speak about alcohol, we speak about sort of the dairy, gluten. Which are the worst in your order of priority according to sort of to the data? Um, I would say the, anything processed comes first. If it doesn't look like it, it came from Mother Nature, that is probably the worst thing for us to be consuming. And then sugar. I think sugar has a very negative effect in our body. Um, so, you know, substituting with stevia or, you know, eliminating sugar altogether, I think is is probably where we should be starting or at least reducing it drastically. Um, and then can come the gluten and the dairy and whatever else you can fit into your lifestyle. Okay, fascinating. Where, where would you put seed oils in terms of canola oil and vegetable seed oils that have been shown to be very inflammatory and inflammatory. cause a lot of issues and, and diabetes now? You know, I had Tim Noakes on the podcast, fascinating, low carbohydrate, high fat diet. We spoke about maybe changing the acronym to low carbohydrate, low fat, and those are the vegetable seed oils, you know, that are in very inflammatory, you know, mm -hmm. in their nature, the canola oil, sunflower oil, palm oil, corn oil. Uh, where would you put that on the list? Because I think that's really, really important. Yeah, to me, that's a processed food, right? So I would put those very high. We don't cook with those at all. We generally use either avocado oil or olive oil. Um, you can use key if you want, which is clarified butter. Um, that you just have to be careful because if the dairy is not fully skimmed out, it can still have the casein in it. Um, but yes, yeah, definitely eliminating a lot of those processed oils. It's the same. 
Mm. Anything else from a food perspective that you want to talk about or fasting and in terms of cognitive sort of uh, health? Yeah, fasting is great. And I think that's another thing that you have to trial what works best for you. So, you know, if it's intermittent fasting, whether it's from, you know, 14 to 18 hours, whatever works for you, um, that's great. For me personally, I like one 24 hour fast per week. I I like that whole one day of giving my gut rest. And, you know, Mm. it's amazing how much better I feel doing that. Um, So that's another personal choice to kind of play around with what works best with your lifestyle. But yes, they've shown a lot of great research on, you know, how much our brain health improves and gut health improves when we fast and give our bodies a bit of a break from caloric intake. Um, And then also, I think we need to be trying to aim to eat more organic produce as much as possible, because I think that's where all the toxins, a lot of the toxins come in in the glyphosate and, uh, You know, that's they're doing studies where they're finding levels of these chemicals in children because it's just it's in everything. It's in our water sources and our ground sources. So, um, again, you know, not that we should live in fear all the time, but I think any measure that we can make to be limiting some of these inflammatory um, environmental factors is is going to help long term. Possibly you want to unpack. uh... Dr. Kavita, just in terms of autophagy, just maybe explain that how important it is in terms of dealing, you know, from a cognitive basis point of view in terms of these plaques. I know there's a lot of debate whether these plaques in the brain actually cause Alzheimer's or they cause, you know, impulses to get stuck in the brain. But maybe talk about autophagy and maybe the lymphatic system of brain health and how it cleans it out, the cleanup crew of the brain and how important people you know, I need to take it with regards to, you know, brain health. Yeah, so the the tangles or the plaques that we generally see in an MRI with Alzheimer's, they, traditionally it was thought that that was the cause of Alzheimer's. So that was leading to cognitive decline. And so all the drug studies were aimed at getting rid of those plaques and tangles. And now we're seeing research that not only were some of those studies maybe fabricated, the, you know, the results may have been fabricated a little wow. bit, but they were also not showing results, right? The patients have been taking this and there's been no reversal of cognitive decline. So I think, I think it, we can very confidently say that that is not the actual cause of Alzheimer's. Um, it is part, it is a normal process for healthy brains in terms of how they clean up and they get rid of, you know, senescent cells and they, you know, they repair the brain. Um, but I think, is this now a side effect of what's actually happening? It's certainly not the cause. So I think we need to be addressing Alzheimer's from a very different avenue. And I don't know now how many years that's going to take for them to come up with a new modality of treatment that will actually be effective. Um, But I think we are starting to see that if we are addressing a lot of these risk factors, that seems to be helping if we're very strict about it, though. Okay, so are there any studies of doing you know, a whole bunch of lifestyle factors and then comparing those that haven't done it. And then the research shows, well, if you put these things in place, you know, it's, you know, preventing the onset of Alzheimer's or it's dealing with the sort of severity of Alzheimer's. Yeah, there isn't any, there aren't any large studies that have been done with just lifestyle modification and supplementation yet. Um, I know Dr. Bredesen's doing a lot of research in this area, and he's mm. found that by using his protocol, he is reversing mild cognitive decline. Um, so I think there's there's certainly some merit to it. It'll, it would be nice, though, for them to do some large trials showing, you know, where we can show that um, what kind of impact can actually, actually be made by doing these these changes. I think right now, we just have to do what we feel would be best to, to reduce our risk and hopefully not turn on those genes if we happen to be predisposed um, to cognitive decline. Okay, so we've unpacked nutrition. Fasting is really, really important with regards to just giving gut rays, good for the microbiome, good for autophagy, the cleanup crew, dealing with sort of things in the, the brainwash and the glyphatic system that happens at night. So sleep and nutrition, what are the fundamental sort of foundational pillars do you recommend? And then, you know, obviously speak about your life. Mm -hmm. So the next is, you know, exercise. I think we have to stay active. Um, Also, I think using our minds. So 
we need to be constantly learning new things and you know whatever that may be for you um, whether it's reading or in my case i started singing so um, i've been doing that for a few years now i started painting so i've done like a gallery showing and just kind of stepping outside my yeah, comfort zone yeah. you know i've always lived and breathed science and so it's been interesting tapping into the artistic side for me um you know i do a lot of crossword puzzle wordle i love wordle um you know just trying to always be learning new things whether you're whether you plan on using it or not i think that's key to that we keep our mind sharp with not only movement but also with education okay and do you know the research or studies on like high intensity interval training versus aerobic exercise or resistance training because people are going to be looking out there for general health and you know should they be walking should they be doing like resistance training going to the gym or pilates and what's your view on the different types of exercise yeah there's certainly benefit to high intensive uh, high intensity interval training um they have shown right how beneficial the short but you know more difficult exercises can be. This is where, again, perimenopausal women have to be careful. Our cortisol is already high with our estrogen and progesterone dropping and testosterone. Um, so sometimes for women, as we're aging, it's not necessary to stress our bodies even further. I think brisk walking every day is great. Meditating is amazing. They're showing how much we can repair our gray matter if we just meditate on a daily basis and reduce our, our stress and cortisol by doing that um so in which case then yoga and pilates would be amazing too where you're still strengthening your body um but you're also stilling your mind possibly in the process um and then weight training 100 percent. we all our testosterone starts to drop by like 17 percent per you know per decade after we turn 30 to maintain not only muscle mass but also then bone health um, and you know our spinal health it's important that we that we you know, do some form of strength training at least two to three times a week, for sure. Brilliant. So, and in terms of your exercise, I mean, what are people saying with regards to, you know, the studies on doing crosswords and Sudoku and word things or oh, video games? I know there was a recent study a while back, actually, when I say re recent COVID sort of changed it, but I think just before COVID, you know, having a look at, you know, the older generation playing video games and that improves sort of cognitive ability and learning new things. How important is that for, for people to do? Um, yeah, I think there, we don't have exact research on whether doing a crossword puzzle is, he, you know, improving our gray matter. But I think we do know that by using our minds, and we're not just watching mindless TV and streaming all day long or sitting on social media, I think those things are actually detrimental the, to not only our, our stress levels and mental health, mm. but um, I think by staying active and doing things that are actually stimulating your mind, for sure, I think long term, will have a greater impact than doing things that we're where we're not stimulating our mind okay good all right next sort of pillar that you would say we've spoken about nutrition we've spoken about movement we've spoken about sleep maybe you want to unpack stress because i mean stress is quite a mm -hmm. you know it sounds like it's a huge role with regards to i mean a lot of diseases but specifically sort of brain health tell us mm -hmm. a sort of a bit of story on stress and how important it is and how you reduce stress other than meditation yeah, so we know for a fact, right, that stress, elevated cortisol levels, which cortisol is our fight or flight um, hormone, elevated amounts of that on, on a chronic basis, we know is quite detrimental to the brain. Um, and I think post COVID now we're seeing an even larger increase in stress and anxiety. Um, again, in perimenopausal women, we see an increase there too, where women start to think they're crazy because their hormones are dropping and they don't know why they're feeling so stressed out all the time. And we're busy. Our lifestyles are significantly busier now than in decades past. Like we just take on so much, I think, as, you know, both genders. So there's lots of steps that we can do. It's, I mean, it's easier said it, it does take work, I think, to truly reduce your stress levels. But I think it really does mean unplugging um you know as i mentioned earlier social media scrolling constantly like that that does not help our long-term mental health at all comparing ourselves to everyone else mm. reading the news all the time a lot of times it's good to just unplug from the news um you know meditating again as i mentioned is is an amazing way to start even if it's just one or two minutes in the beginning of just deep breathing um to reduce our cortisol levels again going for a walk um is 
for me, singing is incredibly meditative. It stimulates the vagus nerve. So if you can find ways to do that, whether it's humming or cold baths, um, have been shown to significantly reduce our cortisol levels and stimulate the vagus nerve, um, which can be quite beneficial if you can tolerate it. Um, but I think that's something that as a as a population, we do need to be addressing mental health. There's a large increase in mental health um, diseases. Okay. So that's really, really cool. I mean, singing, humming, you know, stimulating mm -hmm. the vagus nerve. Maybe you want to just unpack, you know, what the vagus nerve. We've spoken a lot about the vagus nerve on the show, but maybe sort of give us sort of a little bit of a back story on the vagus nerve and anything else. I know that Africa, you know, being in South Africa, the storytelling and dance and music, uh, mm -hmm. those things are important. Uh, physical touch, embracing people, right. you know, how important that is. But maybe sort of round that up for us in terms of the vagus nerve and why the vagus nerve is so important. Yeah, so the vagus nerve is the one that if we activate it, it releases our calming hormones. So um, like you mentioned, there's so many ways to do that. Um, and social community is one of them. They show in the blue zones how happy, how much happier those communities are. And I do believe you're right. It's because of the social aspect and family and and touch and hugs and feeling loved that makes such a big difference um so if it means surrounding yourself with people that make you happier and yeah. not with people that don't make you happy i think that's a choice that we need to start being okay with right that it's okay to detach from all forms of toxicity whether it's humans or chemicals okay good well let's go straight into i think your sort of happy space of perimenopausal women and mm -hmm. you know what's happening with like xenoestrogen someone's listening out there and you know they're really struggling with brain fog maybe you want to sort of uh give us an explanation of brain fog and what's happening to women perimenopausally or and then we can talk about sort of your sort of special interest in that area because you know toxicity has become a huge issue we'll link to dr stephanie Sanef, who wrote the toxic legacy he was on the show show as well just what's happening to all these endotoxins that are sort of produced by a lot of the factors in our lives as well so let us know a little bit about someone who comes to you woman brain fog maybe sort of perimenopausal you know let's let, let, take us through the journey dr kavita yeah so perimenopause which is all the years leading up to essentially when our period stops right it's, it's technically a natural process we know that it happens um you know the first the first hormone to start dropping in both men and women is testosterone. So now we're we're talking, we lose muscle mass and bone health is, is at risk. Um, then it's progesterone, which messes with our sleep and mood um, and then estrogen, right? And so again, now our mood starts to be affected significantly. Stress goes up, anxiety goes up and a lot of women feel foggy. And I think it's partially probably due to poor sleep um, but also just without these hormones, we just don't function as well. Um, so in terms of addressing that, it again, it's almost identical to the way we address cognitive decline in general, that we have to look at the big picture. You, there's not one quick fix. Um, I do like to re recommend bioidentical hormone replacement for women that are, you know, that qualify for it if they have no other risk factors. Um, because replacing them can often really help improve a lot of those symptoms and the brain fog is one of them. Um, and then it's got to be a lot of lifestyle choices. Um, perimenopausal women don't process carbohydrates the same anymore. So even what a lot of women find is that suddenly the things they were doing, you know, five, six years ago don't work anymore. And the diet has to be very, very strict um, and much, much healthier. Um, again, a mental, from a mental health standpoint, you know, staying active, being social, surrounding yourselves with the right people and the right foods becomes critical because our gut microbiome is thrown off by the loss of these hormones. Um, so all the risk factors that we we try to prevent are just amplified with the with the loss of estrogen and progesterone. So for for women, you know, and then I think in my mom's case, for instance she did not present with memory loss initially it was a personality change which now looking back she was in her 50s roughly at the time when her symptoms first started and was it menopausal or was it the beginning of her alzheimer's i don't you know it's hard to tell because they seem exactly mm. the same so i think for women again if they have um, a cluster of symptoms it's more likely to be menopause related in which case they can get their hormone levels checked they can try supplementing and seeing if they improve if it's more serious where it's not just 
you know, forgetting common, like, where did I put my keys? It's more where, what are my keys, right? It's more serious memory loss. That's when we should be considering, you know, going to um, a neurologist and having, you know, a mini mental test done, having an MRI done to check, to see if there's any early stages of Alzheimer's or dementia in general that could be in play. Okay, so someone comes to you, then from your perspective, what are you doing just to help people and with regards to, you know, women that are perimenopausal, or maybe you want to talk about xenoestrogens and just how many estrogens are in sort of the plastics and that are found in our water and the increase yes. of estrogen that's causing issues. So you know, give us a sort of a, a backstory on that and what you recommend these women do because obviously they're in this sort of transitional time in their lives and it's difficult it's difficult for them yeah because it's out of our control right and i think the first thing that i i've been trying to do when i started revival is educating women because i think for years we've again we've normalized it as we do with many disease states um that you know this is normal this is what women go through mm. and but we're seeing a link between these these side effects and long-term chronic disease whether it's cognitive decline um heart disease you know osteoporosis we're seeing fibromyalgia a lot of perimenopausal women seem to be the demographic that has the larger um incidence of having these diseases so i think it's something we need to start addressing to start reversing some of this risk um and, and when you yes, say education sorry doctor if you do just what we've spoken now everything we've spoken up you educate mm -hmm. women you come in yes because i think they can't advocate for themselves if they don't know to be asking for help um or that we don't need to normalize it anymore um because i think in medicine we're still we're still not doing a preventative approach to how we address long-term disease risk um, it still seems to be a treat after the fact. And by then it's too late. And my mom was a great example of that. And she herself was a physician. My dad's a physician and we missed wow. it. So, um, you know, it's, it was very eye opening when it happens to somebody and she was non drinker, non smoker, you know, didn't have any other major risk factors that would have been, you know, concerning to us that this could happen. So I think we, we're at risk, we don't know we're at risk. And then it we just feel unwell. And then that can turn into other long term diseases. And yeah, from the xenoestrogens, we're, we're just bombarded with it. So I think this is where the the more we take care of ourselves and try to eliminate plastics from our life. Um, for instance, I only use glass water bottles, you know, you store your food in glass, try not to use pans that have a lot of the nonstick coating on them, you know, as much as we can reduce all the chemicals we're ingesting. Um, environmentally, it's a little harder to control unless you can, you know, bring filters into your into your home, um, filter water. Although, you know, in first world countries, we do consider our water clean. It has a lot of microplastics and pesticides and organophosphates in that water that is going to slowly kill us. So I think we need to be filtering our water, whether it's with reverse osmosis or carbon filters or, you know, whatever you can get for your home. Um, that can certainly help reduce how much damage we're doing to our bodies and to our hormonal system. Uh, the natural loss of those hormones is going to happen no matter what. But if we can, you know, prevent amplifying the issue, that's that's ideal. And I think we can do that also with diet by the stronger we make our own immune system and our own gut microbiome, we can filter and process a lot better than if we don't try to create our own you know, healthy environment. Good. And then what about, you know, topical creams and, you know, lotions? And I think that and, there was a stat that like a woman, by the time she has her first cup of tea or coffee in the morning, has put 130 chemicals on her body. And then by the end of the day, there's 168 chemicals that she's put on her body that sort of just seep into a system that are huge endocrine or hormonal disruptors. You know, how yes. important is that with regards to, you know, lipstick and eyeshadow and eyeliner mm -hmm. and all these things for women? Yeah, it's the same, right? These our body is literally a sieve that's letting all of this in. Um, and it, it is it's in all of our lotions and lipstick, they say there's, there's a certain level of lead in our lipstick yeah, that we're constantly yeah. we're literally ingesting it daily. So we need to be looking for companies that are using natural sources and eliminating a lot of these chemicals. Um, you know, the, the scarier part is that sometimes we don't even know until years later that, oh, that ingredient wasn't good for us after all. But mm -hmm. um, if we can try to at least source, you know, 
shampoos and conditioners that don't have all the chemicals in it. And yes, it means, you know, doing with less, we've gotten used to, you know, very effective products that, that we like, and we like the scent of them. Um, even things like inhaling a lot of candles and, you know, essential oils, we have to be careful, right, that we're aerosolizing so much and ingesting it that um, I think as much as we can reduce how much we're intentionally putting into and onto our bodies is key. So what should people do in terms of like the toxicity of using like antiperspirants and base on their face? And should they go totally natural? You know, what they what should they do? Because I mean, I think that's because causing a lot of problems, all this sort of especially for women's health. Yeah, so ne- regular deodorant has aluminum in it, which you know, I don't think is the direct cause of Alzheimer's, but we know there is a link with aluminum and which is why years ago they got rid of pots and pans that were made from aluminum. Um, so yes, yeah, switching to a natural deodorant, if, you know, if you can do so is, is definitely ideal. Um, and there are lots on the market that are actually fairly effective. It just might mean you have to, you know, maybe bathe more than once a day. Um, it doesn't have the same efficacy as an aluminum based deodorant, but it's certainly significantly better for your health. Okay, great. All right, let's move on to the genetic sort of SNPs and uh, that people might want to do testing wise, you know, the APO E3 and 4. And, you know, what's your sort of thinking of regarding that if someone's had, you know, family history of Alzheimer's, dementia and cognitive decline, maybe you can sort of, you know, explain to people what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's and what tests they can do, genetic tests. Is our DNA analysis tests very good for these type of neurodegenerative conditions? Yeah, so dementia is an umbrella term. Um, it's it's the entire cognitive decline disease state is dementia. And then Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia, um, which causes the plaques and the tangles in the brain. And that's how that presents on an MRI. Then you can have like Parkinson's like dementia, you can have vascular dementia where there's an issue with your blood vessels, and that's what causes damage to the brain. So there's numerous different types. Alzheimer's is the most prevalent. Um, and then, um, sorry, what was the genetic testing? Should they, should testing. people do? Yeah. So APOE4 is the gene that has been linked to Alzheimer's. Um, I personally have not chosen to do it yet. I, my, my opinion on it, the verdict is still out for me personally. I feel that just because you have the gene does not mean you will get Alzheimer's and finding out that you don't have the gene does not mean you won't either. So I think you don't want to become too comfortable. I, I've, I'm choosing to lead my life as though I have a high risk of getting it. Um, and I think that's how we all should be approaching it because I also feel that we may not know all the genes that are linked to Alzheimer's yet. I don't think we know enough about it that we can say if we have that one, then we're at risk, but if we don't, we're safe. Um, so certainly if it for you makes you f- you know, feel that it might motivate you to be more proactive if you find out you have it. Um, But then you also don't want to become comfortable if you don't. I think there's so many other causations of Alzheimer's that I think just knowing your genetic history is not enough. Okay, good. Yeah, go for it. Oh, no, I was just going to say with genes, you know, it's kind of like a library book. Depending on what you do in your life, you can either check that book out or it can remain untouched on a shelf. And so... I think that's why for me making all these lifestyle changes is hopefully what will not turn that gene on for me personally. Okay, good. Let's go to your own story with your mom. What happened? Just give us some detail there and then how you started Revival and, you know, the importance and what you guys do and sort of your own mission and purpose, you know, that you bring in the company that you're running. So, yeah, my mom, as I mentioned, she had early onset, which means she was diagnosed prior to age 65. I personally noticed symptoms in her, definitely in her probably early to mid fifties, her personality changed significantly. She was a lovely, lovely person. And she became quite argumentative, you know, a little bit um, less warm, I think is the best Mm -hmm. way to put it that I found she argued with me a lot, um, couldn't understand why it would upset me, didn't want to apologize for any of her actions. Um, It was strange. It, it, It affected our relationship for several years because I couldn't understand what was happening and why she was acting like that. 
Um, and then it wasn't until we started to see a significant decline that she was diagnosed. And by then her brain had atrophied or shrunk by 50%. So she had prog progressed quite a bit before we officially had her MRI done. Um, she just passed away during COVID. Um, and it's interesting because it's one of the saddest things in my life has had the most profound outcome for me um, because she was probably one of the people I was most close to. We were very, very um, tight and seeing her decline and that it could happen to someone like her who didn't have any other risk factors that I could see at the time. Now we, you know, as she became more ill, she actually became diabetic. I think she was glucose intolerant around the time she was diagnosed, which we now know that blood sugars have a strong correlation with brain health. Um, I don't think she slept well, you know, all those things that we've talked about. I'm like, oh, she did actually have some mm -hmm. of those risk factors, but the minor ones, not anything that would have been more telling. Uh, but for me, it gave me a great concern, not only for my own brain health, but then as I'm aging and we're seeing how perimenopausal women have an increased risk of, de of developing Alzheimer's amongst other diseases. Um, that's the reason I ended up starting Revival. I, I wanted to educate women. I wanted to provide some solutions, you know, and if nothing else, arm them with the education that they need to go and speak with their healthcare practitioners so that they can be advocating for themselves and getting treatment sooner rather than later. I just want to prevent as many scenarios of what happened to my mom as possible, catching things early where it may be reversible then once it's, you know, at the point where she was diagnosed, it's too late. Um, so, you know, for me, it's her illness has brought me into a world that um, hopefully we, you know, I can help more women not go through what she went through. So that's the premise of Revival. We're developing a supplement stack that has, you know, 40 ingredients in it that I feel all women should be taken to address some of their, their symptoms, whether it's sleep, inflammation, um, stress, uh, but formulated in a way that's easy to take if women are interested in doing that. Um, hopefully bringing in some diagnostics, at-home diagnostics, so we can bridge the gap where, you know, of access to healthcare too. So that's kind of phase two, I would love to do that. Um, well, maybe let me stop you there. Let's let's talk about some specific supplements that people that are out there, maybe they you yeah. know can't get a hold of Revival yet, the supplement. What are the important supplements that people should take? Yeah, so I mentioned the ones that I take for sleep. So I think helping to promote your sleep is is great. Um, and then reducing inflammation in the body. So things like turmeric, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D. We know that vitamin D is now low. Vitamin D levels are now linked with numerous diseases. And most people are low. In when, um, when I was in clinical practice, uh, we tested most of our patients and almost everyone had low vitamin D levels, regardless of their lifestyle. Um, so whether it's, you know, you're just indoors all the time, we're using sunscreen, we, you know, might have darker colored skin, in which case we're not absorbing the UV rays to convert vitamin D in our skin. And the amount of vitamin D we need is not just a therapeutic level anymore. Like we, mm -hmm. to actually prevent disease, we need to be taking more. Um, so let me stop you there, are... Dr. Kavita, because I've asked a lot of people this and specialists all over the world and having been in practice for 23 years, you know, generally I try and keep patients at 60 NGs per ML with regards to their levels, because I think it's crucially important. 95% of mm -hmm. South Africans here are vitamin D deficient, especially those with dark, dark skin. And obviously right. the darker skins they need, the more sunlight they need, and people don't realize that. But what level would you say is important with regards to vitamin D levels? Yeah, that's a good level to aim for, I think. Um, and if you can't have it tested, you know, generally I recommend no less than, you know, three to 4,000 units per day, depending on the time of year. Again, if it's winter and you're in a colder climate, then you may want to take closer to four to 5,000 units and then slightly less when it's summertime, if you're getting exposure. But again, with our with our concern for skin cancer and not exposing ourselves to UV as much, I think it's harder to um, to maintain that. And as you mentioned, we live in Barbados now. Um, my husband, just as a routine, you know, physical for for the year, had his vitamin D level tested, and it was low. And we're in a hot country where we get almost 365 days of sunshine, and we go for a walk every single day, and his levels were low. Wow. So that's telling that probably the majority of people are living with a low vitamin D level. 
Okay, so 60 NGs per ml. You mentioned omega-3 fatty acids. We do a whole sort of breakdown here at Mainty Thrive, mm -hmm. having looking at omega-9s, you know, omega-7s, omega-3s, omega-6s. It's really, really important in terms of brain health. So maybe is are there is there research about DHA, how important it is? You know, it's very difficult to mm -hmm. convince people often to take omega-3 because of the sort of poor quality out there, their density and acidity yes. and toxicity. So maybe right. just speak a bit about omega-3 and brain health. Yeah, so omega-3 is the one that's been shown to help improve brain health. Um, and I, what I've noticed to date is most of the grocery store, store brands, they're very, very low dosed. So what you, the amount of milligrams that you see on the front is just the total amount of fish oil that's in these capsules, not the amount of what we should be looking for is the EPA and the DHA levels on the side of the bottle. And that usually means you have to take you, no less than four to six of those capsules per day really to get the amount of DHA and EPA that we recommend for brain health. Um, so this How much do you recommend per day, Dr. Kavita? Uh, no less than a thousand milligrams of each, um, okay. preferably closer to 15, 1600 milligrams, even if you can get that. But, it, but the problem with this is the dosing that we recommend, even like for turmeric, you, you know, up to upwards of 500 to milligrams to a thousand milligrams a day, vitamin D, like these, these doses for actual long-term disease prevention are high. So you can be taking handfuls of pills every day which is what I was trying to solve by blending it all down and formulating it differently. But I think if nothing else, if you are going to take an omega-3, which is, I think, one of the most important ones next to vitamin D, um, definitely aim for over a thousand milligrams per day of DHA and EPA. Okay. So omega-3s, you said turmeric. Uh, mm -hmm. you said, what else is important to the regards to supplementation? Yeah, so then again, if we're trying to look at reducing stress levels, then ashwagandha is helpful, rhodiola. Um, I really like to recommend tulsi or holy basil, which is um, quite anti-inflammatory and has been shown to be effective for you know cognitive decline. Um, Ceylon cinnamon is another one that helps regulate blood sugars, uh, which, is, which is good to take long term. Um, a good B12. And then the issue with B12 is we don't absorb it very well orally. So you want mm. to be making sure you're either taking it sublingually um, or by injection if you can, if you are actually have low B12 levels. Um, and then what else? Oh, uh, functional mushrooms are another, of course, hot topic right now, which I highly advocate for. You know, the the cordyceps helps with energy and lion's mane crosses the blood brain barrier. So it's very good for brain health. Um, you know, Rishi and Chaga are um, adaptogenic and can help reduce stress. So there's so many things that we can be taking that can help reduce our stress levels, address inflammation in the body that I think can help us long term. Maybe you obviously people have got a budget out there, Dr. Kavita. And so maybe give us the most important is it so like your EPA, DHA, and then just give us a list down with obviously functional mushrooms or something that we also, you know, look at here. But people have got certain, you know, they've only got sort of a propensity to take so many pills yes. and then they've got a budget. So from perspective of brain health, what are, what are the top sort of five or 10, you know, supplements that people should be looking at? Yeah, I would take a vitamin D. Um, if you can get a vitamin K, MK7, that helps with the transportation of the calcium to the bone. Um, so in conjunction with a vitamin D, that's a good one to have. Omega-3 for sure. A good B complex. Um, I think uh, turmeric is another one. Ashwagandha. And I would say those are my top six that I would recommend for somebody that you're right, that's on a budget that just needs to get started. For women, um, again, if you're being tested for anemia, then you may want to consider a heme-based iron, um, far better absorbed than the other salt, you know, iron salts that are often given out and much easier on the gut. Um, but that also, if we don't have proper blood flow, then our brain health can't be optimized either. Oh, so, you know, do you look at ferritin levels and make sure that they, you know, maybe you can tell us about your experience here, because I see a lot of people that are sort of postmenopausal, you know, they've got mm -hmm. too high ferritin, becomes very oxidative, and they've got high inflammatory markers because of that, and we send them to donate blood, and then you see some young folk as well, they were really low ferritin, and that can cause issues, so maybe give us a little bit of your own story on iron. Yeah, so iron, um, I would say a large portion of women are probably low in iron and don't realize it, which also then contributes to fatigue and poor sleep. Um, so definitely getting blood work done for that is is key. 
Um, and then I always recommend, like I mentioned, a heme based iron. So it's made from it is an animal product, but it's the type of iron that we store in our cells. So we absorb it far better. It doesn't interact with all the foods that the iron salts do, because um, generally like the ferrous sulfate and the ferrous fumarate that's usually prescribed for iron deficiency anemia. It's very hard on the gut, um, interacts with so many different things, but it's best absorbed if you take it on an empty stomach because we absorb so little of it. Whereas the heme based irons are just they're far better absorbed it's it would be like eating red meat essentially which you know we can't do in large amounts, so this is a much more efficient way of supplementing your iron, if you are iron deficient. And what number would you look at in terms of ferritin uh, Dr Kavita. I'm not uh, I don't know off the top of my head okay. Okay. All right. Any other sort of like biohacks that people can do? You know, we've got a strong biohacking community. You know, you, you mentioned cold plungers, uh, infrared sauna in terms of, you know, just cognitive, you know, help. What other things can people do with regards to, you know, if they really want to take it to the next level? Yeah, I think trying to improve your growth hormone too. So again, with fasting, that's been proven to, you know, cause growth hormone spikes, especially if you fast for at least 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, I like to sometimes even do 36. It's, you do feel remarkably well after about a 36 hour fast. Um, also, again, the HIIT workouts can do that to cause a growth hormone spike, right, which is great for brain health and just overall longevity. Um, and then, yeah, as you mentioned, the saunas, the, um, the cold plunges or even cold showers, right? You can just turn your shower down to really, really cold for the last 30 seconds to a minute. However long you can tolerate at the end of a shower is a, is a easier way of doing it, I guess, than filling a bathtub with ice. Mm. Okay, great. All right, we're coming to the end of the show. Maybe just tell us about Revival in terms of what you do. You said supplements. What other products do you do and why do you do them? Yeah, so we haven't actually started the next phase yet, but ideally we've been researching some of the at home based diagnostics. So they're coming up with testing kits where women can do pap smears at home okay. um, or there's blood tests that can be testing for um, breast cancer markers. Uh, so, again, it's just not that we should do away with mimograms and annual testing that, you know, all that all women should be doing regardless. But this is in addition to, so we can maybe be catching things sooner. If you don't have access to a physician, which many women don't, this is a this is a way that they can be starting to take some of the ownership of their own health and then they know what they need to do next. Brilliant. Okay. Give us a message of hope for, you know, you know, people out there. I think brain fog, if I look at some of sort of the work we've done, the videos we release, brain fog gets, you know, so many hits and that, you know, mm -hmm. a message of hope for people, what they, you know, because a lot of despair, anxiety out there, depression out there, and people just feel overwhelmed with their health. But what would Dr. Kavita say with regards to sort of brain health and 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 hope regarding sort of future healthy brains? Yeah, so I think it's not impossible to achieve a healthy brain and we are not alone i think that's the other issue is that we we think we're struggling with these things alone whether it's mental health issues or brain fog or our risk of cognitive decline um but they're we're all in the same boat and i think you know this is the whole reason that we should be again listening to podcasts like yours and educating mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. and making small changes and those small changes can accumulate over time and you know give us a brighter future in terms of improving our our brain health good okay maybe last question because we haven't addressed the kids question you know i've got two children sounds like you've got kids as well you know what's really, really really important what's the number one thing that people can like start today with their kids to make sure that they're good good brain health i mean i'm just seeing so many kids here at the practice adhd and they're really struggling with mm -hmm. anxiety i think teenagers have gone up in terms of the use of antidepressants by 20 percent so mm -hmm. you know, give us the number one thing that parents can do so I think it starts with diet. Um, you know, I, it's harder with kids to have them eat the way we eat, but mm. we do try to make sure that at every meal they're eating fruits and vegetables. Um, and if we start that from a very, very young age, they're much more likely to adopt that as they as they enter adulthood and reducing the processed, again, foods and sugars. Um, it's just, it's adding chemicals. As I mentioned, they've done studies where kids' blood levels of some of these chemicals are already at levels that are worrisome for long-term health. Sure, um, so sure. definitely starting with that. And then in our household, we do limit social media for our kids. It's, it makes us kind of the unfavorable parent in this generation, but we just, we, our eldest is a teenager and we just don't want her to have mental health issues down the road because I think we're seeing studies on that too, that it's a given 
that kids do not do well when they're on social media too often. So we do limit that a little bit in our home. Brilliant. Well, I declare favor and blessing over you, Dr. Kavita Desai, and that uh, River Vale would do really, really well. Your calling, your purpose to help people, especially women's health, and, you know, to prevent other stories, the ones of your own, you know, with your own mom. So I think you've moved from sort of pain to purpose, you know, went through a lot of pain with regards to how close you had with your relationship with your mom. And so we salute you and we say thank you for your time and, and just look forward to connecting and wish all the best for Revival and, and hope it goes well. Thank you so much.